welcome to the uh, second lecture of the, the module uh, discussing risk assessment and life cycle analysis uh, in the ecology and environment course. In the previous lecture, we talked a little bit about uh, health risk assessment and uh, the definition of health risk. And uh, we came up to a point where uh, we discussed the uh, entry of a pollutant uh, from a particular source into the environment. So, in this uh, lecture, we will discuss a little more about the, uh, the transport of pollutants in the environment. So, uh, we see that the uh, sources, there are various sources, different processes, uh, product manufacturing and different things, uh, source could be anything, could be natural or anthropogenic, but we are talking mainly about anthropogenic sources, which are uh, mainly things that we do. Uh, and the sources uh, release chemicals into the environment uh, here and from there it gets to the human being. So, the question is what is this transport? How do they get transported from the place where they are released into the environment and then to the uh, humans? So, transport of pollutants, transport of uh, any chemical or any pollutant like any other transport uh, requires a medium that moves. So, uh, in the environment, this means that there is a medium that moves. There are only two mediums that move in the environment. One is water and one is air. So, we take a brief look at uh, uh, these two environmental media, water and air, and see how at what extent they move and then how, how can they influence the uh, transport of pollutants in the environment. So, water can be divided. The, the way water is present in the environment is in different forms. Uh, as uh, surface water, which is essentially rivers, uh, oceans, lakes, and then as ground water. So, rivers uh, and streams have a very distinct starting point and an end point, um, and they flow. And that is one of the major things. They have a velocity and they flow from point A to point B. Uh, and we, we know that many of the rivers start sometimes in the mountains and end up in the sea. This is not necessarily true, but uh, this is uh, one uh, example of a river system. Streams is generally classified as a small things, uh, a small canal that is uh, connecting two rivers or connecting a lake to a river and such and such. So, we have canals for irrigation and, uh, and for uh, storm water drainage in, uh, in major cities. Uh, we have oceans and seas. Uh, this is a very large body of water connecting sometimes uh, uh, different continents and uh, seas are generally named given to smaller uh, uh, sections of this uh, oceanic body. They do not have a very specific starting and end point uh, and they also uh, uh, do not don't have a specific start end point and also do not have a, a very well defined flow, but they have flow in them inherently and this you see that uh, in the form of waves that is always moving. And, uh, there is a current, there are large number of currents which are small and large in size. Uh, that move, water moves as rivers within the seas and oceans and this can carry uh, pollutants. And this is also a function of season and uh, different seasons these currents move in different directions and therefore, pollutants can move in different directions as well. Then we have lakes and ponds, these are very small, these are smaller in comparison to ocean, uh, the oceans or sometimes the rivers, but there are very large lake systems in the world. There is one such as the Great Lake systems in between the United States of, uh, United States of America and Canada the border there are five great lakes and there are other big lakes uh, in, in Europe and in Africa. And uh, these are overall they are static, but uh, depending on their size, they also can have local currents that move which both laterally as well as vertically. There is vertical movement that can be generated within the lakes as a result of uh, convection, thermal convection and density difference. And this is more predominant in colder regions where there is very significant temperature differences. Uh, between different layers of water and therefore, that this induces some kind of uh, vertical mixing. If you look at uh, ground water, ground water or the other terms for ground water is, uh, is, is aquifer. Ground water aquifer also flows and there is a gradient because ground water is sitting on top of a bedrock. It is, uh, it is just soil which is filled with water and it moves in the direction of this gradient, this, uh, this slope that exists between uh, a, a particular uh, point and another point neighboring to that. And the flow is very slow. So, 
there is a difference in the way in which uh, the flow occurs in each of these systems and that is understanding of this system is very important to understanding how a pollutant moves. We come to air, uh, we have different scales of air, uh, what we consider as air, it is a very local air. For example, the uh, air above Chennai uh, behaves in a certain way, there are land breeze, sea breezes and uh, there are certain patterns that, that depend on the topography and the geography of this region. And the air mass movement above a place like Chennai is very different from the air mass movement of a place like Bombay or Delhi or uh, any other uh, uh, city location in India or worldwide. And there are also regional air masses, this is also dependent on the weather patterns in that system and this we have continental air mass and, uh, on a, and on a global scale. So we see that there are, um, there is a lot of debate and discussion uh, with relates to global warming where we, we look at um, carbon dioxide concentrations across the world, uh, an average concentration across the globe is a result of air mass that is uh, carbon dioxide that is released from one place, it moves to other places and there is a mixture, mixing of this on a global scale and therefore one has to worry about uh, what others are doing in this context. So we will discuss that uh, in, a, in a different module and a little bit of that later in this uh, module as well. So transport in water, we look at transport in water, pollutants move at a rate at which the water moves by and large. So there are, um, when water does not move, there are pollutant also moves but we would not discuss that here at this point. Uh, it is not relevant to this particular discussion uh, and there is something that a little more uh, details to that that is not required at this point. Pollutants do move at a rate at which water flows, if water flows they move along with it and rivers in general move at a rate. Uh, um, and the velocity that depends on, a, on the amount of water they receive and also on the slope of the river. For example, the river Ganga flows very fast in its upper reaches uh, where, where it, when it is in the hills than when it reaches uh, the plains near the delta region near the Bay of Bengal. And river Ganga also flows at a higher velocity during the monsoon period when uh, it receives a lot of water inflow from its tributaries and, uh, and runoff than during the non-rainy season when it is fairly dry and this, uh, the size of the river also changes as a result of it. And definitely the pollutant moves in the direction in which the water moves. So rivers do have a definite uh, flow path in general, they do have, the rivers have known to change directions as a result of geographical changes that but occurs over a very long period uh, um, due to natural and anthropogenic factors. So to give you an idea just to illustrate this uh, the transport of uh, water, so there is a, a river that is flowing in a certain direction as indicated by this uh, blue stream and there is a, a location, there is a particular facility, uh, let us call it a, a unit, an industrial unit or anything, any source of pollution is indicated by this, uh, by this symbol which has a hazardous material and if this hazardous material is uh, released into water, it flows towards a, um, a receptor uh, which is indicated by uh, this happy uh, human face and it, while it, it is flowing continuously and we assume that there is always some material being uh, deposited and if this person, if this receptor uses water from this uh, location, it is very likely that it can cause a health effect. Uh, in this particular human being. So there is the sense that if you are downstream to a, a polluting source then you are likely to see the effect of, you are likely to be exposed to this particular uh, contaminant. This happens in rivers. In groundwater, the, uh, the flow in comparison to rivers is very, uh, is significantly slow um, because groundwater, if you look at this uh, cross section here, this is soil what we generally call as unsaturated uh, medium which is soil which may have moisture but not enough uh, to be called as groundwater. Groundwater is when the sand, uh, the soil is completely saturated with water, all the pore spaces are filled with water. And we have uh, a source here, we also have a receptor, the groundwater is accessed by, by the means of uh, a well and we see that the well water is rising in this well and this is supplying this particular receptor with ground water. And if it happens that there is a release of a pollutant that is uh, sitting in here into the uh, soil, over a period of time 
this will move and it moves slowly because this is not like a river. This, this flow in a porous media is much slower uh, because there is a lot of uh, resistance to flow and it goes, it keeps going and uh, the water that is seen here is still not uh, hazardous because it has not seen the effect of this. It has been some time since the flow, uh, the release has happened but the well does not still see the, uh, the pollution. And once the well sees the pollution, you see that the water then becomes contaminated and then as a result of which the receptor also becomes, uh, can become unhealthy and this is the effect of uh, groundwater. In coastal regions, there is also a pollutant release uh, from at one point can move to another uh, location due to currents and wave action. And, uh, so the summary of this is the transport of pollutants requires a good understanding of the nature of water, how it moves in natural systems and whether it has uh, diurnal variations or seasonal variations and uh, all that is important to assess if a particular pollutant that is released from one place does will have any effect on the uh, population living in a different location. Uh, if you come to atmospheric transport, uh, this is a schematic that generally explains uh, a release a source that is releasing and atmospheric transport is released in the in the gas phase and therefore there is you, you see it in the form of a puff. Sometimes you can visualize it, uh, you can see exhaust coming from factories which, which take the shape of a cloud and they have a certain shape and that shape indicates how they are moving in the atmosphere and you can see it very clearly and this is also a function of uh, the local meteorology as well as uh, uh, at that particular time what, what kind of weather system exists in that, in that uh, location. So the direction of wind plays a very important role in where the pollutant is going. Once it is released, it is going in the direction of the wind and uh, we can see that uh, in this particular schematic and it is usually diluted. As it goes further away from the source, it is diluted. You can see from the, uh, uh, from the way in which the uh, pollutant moves, we can see that the pollutant is diluted in this particular uh, region here. It's, the concentration as indicated by the color, it becomes smaller and smaller because the, the pollutant disperses, it spreads and the spreading is also a function of uh, the meteorology and the, uh, and the temperature that exists at that point. So the puff, the, the pollutant air mass can also behave in different ways depending on the uh, uh, system exists that exists here and it can, for example, it can behave like this where it can reach the ground very quickly. It can also behave like this where it does not reach the ground at all, it just keeps going up and uh, somebody on the ground is not exposed to this particular air mass that is going here. So this is all important in uh, air pollution management where we, uh, depending on the local meteorology and the local this thing, we can uh, try to design exhaust methods where which have least impact on, uh, on human beings, on a receptor. This slide here shows uh, a general overview of the long range transport of uh, gases and aerosols. Uh, so this is a general schematic representation of what you would find in our current society. We have cities and small towns, uh, this uh, essentially represents the uh, residential and the uh, business uh, centers uh, in various cities and we also have agriculture, large agricultural sectors. We have an industrial sector, we have a transportation sector which is in both on the land and as well as in the sea and in water bodies and we have forests which are natural systems which can also release a significant amount of things. So there is, uh, as we see here. We have a large amount of natural and anthropogenic emissions that are released into the environment and this contain uh, gases such as carbon dioxide, methane and uh, hazardous chemicals uh, which is volatile organic carb co compounds and so on and, uh, and a large amount of combustion sources release uh, nitrogen oxide, sulfur oxides and particulate matter. So when we are talking about the impact of this, we are talking about transport. So obviously there is local transport as we saw in the previous slide very close to the surface there is material is moving laterally in the direction of wind. But the wind structure is not uh, as simple as what we see uh, outside and there is a vertical uh, gradient and there is also a vertical mixing of the wind and uh, it is fairly complicated and as, it, as the wind gets more and more turbulent uh, the, there is uh, the structure becomes uh, very complicated and difficult to even, even characterize but by and large we see that there is a mixing of pollutant in this region 
when then there is also exchange between uh, what is the called the lower region is called the boundary layer where the most of the changes of the velocity of the air is happening and then to the upper layer of the troposphere which is the one that is closest to the earth's surface here uh, the chemical has a an opportunity to transform chemical reactions can occur in the presence of uh, other entities and uh, from here there is exchange into the stratosphere we also have sources now in the troposphere such as aircraft emissions with the high volume of aircrafts that are flying across the earth if you just open uh, any uh, um, any of the uh, google map uh, and then we over overlay it with number of aircraft running around it it's sometimes covered with uh, aircraft throughout the day and the night in different parts of the world so the very significant amount of aircraft emissions that occur in the uh, upper troposphere about uh, 30000 feet and in that kind of range then they also exchange into the stratosphere some of it exchange into stratosphere where uh, one of the big examples of chemical transformation in the stratosphere is in that of ozone destruction ozone depletion or the ozone hole that uh, that we that is observed on top of uh, antarctica and uh, uh, this gives a, a very good indication as to the long range transport of uh, aerosols and gases. The other example of long range transport of aerosols is, is the presence is the measurement the presence of anthropogenic chemicals or chemicals that, that relate to specific industrial uh, human activity that is present in locations where there is no human activity. For example, in the pol polar regions where there is not much of industry very low, low intensity of industry we find chemicals in the ice uh, that do not belong there and it is come from somewhere else. So, it is it's, uh, traveled a long distance and deposited there and it may have an impact on the local ecology and the, uh, and the animals and plants that are present in that uh, system. And of course, there is this large uh, section of uh, what these emissions do to things like global warming. Uh, so, global warming ha is a different problem altogether it is in, in the context of, uh, of uh, human intervention. Uh, in general uh, when we talk about health risk uh, carbon dioxide and the uh, uh, greenhouse gases do not enter this discussion that is a different uh, topic altogether which will be dealt with uh, in a different module. So we look at soil pollution the soil has a very uh, um, different kind of structure than water or air. So, soil is non mobile but the issue with soil is soil has the capacity to hold a large amount of chemical uh, both organic and inorganic more of the organic chemicals a, a very large fraction of the chemicals that are manufactured and potentially released into the environment belong belong to the class of organic chemicals uh, for various applications uh, in industry and there is it's possible that a, a large fraction of these enter the soil for various reasons and the soil can hold them for a long time and the only way they release it is they release it slowly to the atmosphere and they release it slowly to the water down below by uh, whenever there is rain it can get slowly dissolve slowly or can get pushed into the uh, towards the water table or can release above uh, into the atmosphere. So, uh, the last few slides have shown that the uh, pollution can result in anthropogenic act from as a result of the uh, human activity can result in long range and short range transport of chemicals and they can also accumulate into in the soil when they are in the soil soils are in contact with plants and they can accumulate into plants and then and the animals that survive on this plant or the or on the soil can also come in contact with uh, into our food chain and therefore, uh, we can be exposed to it even if it is in the soil. So, even though there is no mobile part there is always movement for example, chemicals move in plants uh, there is a experimental evidence to show that it moves. So, water moves through plants we, we water the uh, roots it travels through the plant. So, because water is moving through some mechanism it is not necessarily the same as what you see in, in a river or uh, in an ocean, but it is a different mechanism of movement we have not discussed it here, but it happens in the biological systems and this can take the chemical into uh, uh, the fruit or the flower or any part of the plant and there is a risk of uh, the chemical getting into the food chain. The other compartment of the environment is sediments and this is not seen uh, usually because it is hidden from view for most part this is the mud that is present under a water body. Uh, as you can see in the schematic there is air there is water and below the water there is sediment. So, we have lake sediments we have river sediments we have ocean floor uh, which are all important uh, it is a big very large compartment 
and uh, you can see it when there is no water or if you go under the water, uh, if you take a probe and go under the water. Sometimes. So very often we do not see it but in, Indi in India we have a large number of rivers that do not run uh, have water perennially and therefore we you get an opportunity to see the, uh, the bed of the river and uh, therefore you can find out if there is anything there. In large different parts of the world where there is perennial water supply and rivers serve a very important commercial uh, transport purpose such as the large rivers in Europe and in the United States and also the Great Lake regions where uh, we have a significant amount of uh, uh, commercial activity and all along coastal regions. In India we have a large amount of uh, commercial activity along the coasts where uh, there are uh, you see the concentration of chemical plants or any such activities happening along the coast. So there is a high probability of uh, contamination if uh, um, incorrect methods of disposal are or if, uh, due to accidents or any such uh, uh, events, chemicals can get into the water and they can go into the uh, sediment and sit there. So uh, the schematic shows that when this happens, when chemical is being released, so this is not an indicator that somebody is actually putting a pipeline and dumping uh, chemicals into the water, it is just an uh, just to imp represent a source, there is a source and whatever that source might be, it might be continuous or just discrete and uh, the water gets polluted and we realize that water is polluted we find out what the source is and we stop it. We also find that the water continues to be uh, polluted because it is not coming from here, no, it is coming from here from the contaminated source and like soil the uh, contaminated sediments can hold a large amount of contaminant of, of chemical and if it, if it gets there it will stay there for a long time and release very slowly. So it can result in, in one of those chronic health effects over a period of time, it does not uh, go to a concentration where you can see it immediately and it also accumulates in fish and other plants living there and the, this just continues in the chain of uh, chemical movement through the, through the uh, environment. And so these are some of the processes by which once it is in the sediment it can move into the water and can also move into the air. So uh, this uh, slide gives a uh, a comprehensive view of the linkages between uh, different compartments in the environment uh, for chemicals and exchange. So chemical exchange can happen between air and soil, if there is a chemical in air it can get into soil by exchange, it can, if it is there in soil it can evaporate and can cause an air pollution problem, if it is in soil it can go to water and cause a groundwater pollution problem, if it is there in water it can go to air, air, po air pollution problem and so on. If it is there in any of these three uh, major phases, it can also go into a, uh, the other compartments that are associated with it such as animals and plants and uh, also sediments, sediments exchange with water and there are animals and plants that are associated with the sediment as well. So this is a very complicated linkage of uh, the fate and transport of chemical in our environment and you can add anything else that you would like into this chart, uh, anything, any other structure, any other man-made, uh, human-made structure that uh, ca might intervene and uh, the effects can be studied. So uh, the assessment of health risk, the transport of chemicals is a, is a very important step and we know that once we know a particular source and you know that it can get into the environment and it can get into a particular uh, uh, receptor and uh, there are, one can now then look at uh, what are the possible methods in which we can try to mitigate or address uh, this uh, health risk and how to reduce it and how to implement this into design. So we will look at some of these aspects uh, in the next lecture when we talk more about this, thank you.